Hello, hello, and welcome or welcome back to my channel. So a couple weeks ago in a live, I shared with some of y'all my Katy Perry theory, which honestly, I'm not even really sure if it's a theory rather than it just being more so a series of observations of Katy's career. And so today's video is gonna be a lot of my thoughts, analyses, observations as to why despite Katie having so many iconic songs, so many career highs and memorable moments, she's also had a lot of lows and received a lot of backlash and criticism that I really do think has informed her later three albums quite a bit. So let's go ahead and get into Katy Perry, get into her eras and some of these culture shifts that have informed some of her eras. Katie's no stranger to controversy and has had some in pretty much every era of hers, at least starting from her Katy Perry releases. We can look back at songs on her sophomore album, One of the Boys, like I Kissed a Girl and You're So Gay. In I Kissed a Girl, Katie was accused of trivializing bisexuality, even queerness in general, or fetishizing it. On the other hand, I remember her getting backlash over the song also because she was accused of promoting queerness. Katie's own mother, who spoke out after the song's release, said she and her father were of a similar opinion. I couldn't find many articles from 2008 talking negatively about I Kissed a Girl. It's just something I, and I'm sure a lot of y'all probably remember happening. But I did find an excerpt from a Time article about the song's popularity in general claiming, I Kissed a Girl has ruled the Billboard Hot 100 charts since June, and even though I can't find anyone who will admit to liking the song, it has succeeded in uniting two previously disparate segments of the market. Christian groups who have taken issue with Perry's sudden sophistication, while gay activists are spoiled for choice between I Kissed a Girl's apparent trivialization of lesbianism and the fact that Perry's previous single, You're So Gay, opening lyric, I hope you hang yourself with your H&M scarf, makes her seem like a less than ideal spokeswoman for the cause. To get into You're So Gay, the song is written as a condemnation of one of Katie's exes. It's a song that frames the guy as being this fake, deep, sort of artsy person, and Katie's relating that to a lot of gay stereotypes and then coming to the conclusion the man is closeted and should be honest with himself about it. Walk around like you're oh so debonair, you pull them down and there's really nothing there. Like that Time article pointed out, people were upset about You're So Gay back when it came out. I don't think it was a loud majority, not the general public, rather it was communities like the LGBTQ community being upset about her negatively stereotyping. This was also around the same time those commercials and campaigns were everywhere to get people to stop using the word gay as an insult or as a synonym for something being bad or sucking. Point being, conversations were being had about this type of language, but the national campaigns trying to get people to stop being homophobic, even passively, were relatively new. You know, you really shouldn't say that. Say what? Well, say that something's gay when you mean it's bad. It's insulting. So even though some people were definitely upset, this was a far more lax climate to make a song like You're So Gay in than today. When Katie was asked back in 2008 if the song was homophobic or reinforcing negative stereotypes, she said, Every time I play that song, everybody's come back laughing. I'm not the type of person who walks around calling everything gay. That song is about a specific guy that I used to date and specific issues that he had. The song is about my ex wearing guy liner and taking emo pictures of himself in the bathroom mirror. The listeners have to read the context of the song and decide for themselves. I couldn't find any more recent comments that Katie made about You're So Gay past 2008, but in 2018 she did speak more on I Kissed a Girl. And she told Glamour, Bisexuality wasn't as talked about back then or any type of fluidity. If I had to write that song again, I would probably make an edit on it. Lyrically, it has a couple stereotypes in it. Your mind changes so much in 10 years and you grow so much. What's true for you can't evolve. Katie's next album, Teenage Dream, which came in 2010, is remembered for its record-breaking singles like California Girls, Firework, the title track, and others. The album made Katie the first, and I'm pretty sure the only still, woman to have five songs from an album go number one, the only other artist to achieve this being Michael Jackson. At least at the time that Teenage Dream came out, there doesn't seem like there was much controversy over any of the songs. The most I could find were several articles accusing the Part of Me music video of being military propaganda. In it, after finding out her boyfriend is cheating on her, Katie comes across a billboard trying to recruit women for the Marines. So part of the video is Katie going through basic training, riding around a tank, trying to forget all the happy memories with her ex. The point is clear, like trying to show Katie gaining her power and independence along with a group of other women doing this, but obviously some people were like, why the military concept to express this though? In an article for The Guardian, Naomi Wolf wrote, The creepy parts of the video, in my mind, are many. 
Girl power is represented as what Perry accomplishes in the rigors of basic training. Feminine impulses toward romantic revenge are depicted as rightly channeled into getting armed and being shipped off to some mystery Afghanistan like set overseas, locked and loaded. Trade in your bad boyfriend for a hot AK-47. Apparently the Marines thought the video was good PR though because it was one of the first major music videos to be shot on a base. And Katie herself said about the concept, it's an affirmation of strength, so I wanted to go the strongest route I ever could. Literally, I was like, I'm gonna join the service, I'm gonna join the Marines. We used only Marines. For three days, I was a wannabe Marine, which was so difficult. In addition to the five songs from the standard version of Teenage Dream that went number one, Part of Me, which was on the deluxe album, which is 2012's The Complete Confection, did also. Like Firework, which is one of the number ones on the standard version, it has a similar tone of empowerment and tapping into one's internal strength. Aside from her fun, party-ready hits, this is another type of song that Katie would become well-known for. Speaking of, her lead single from her next album, 2013's Prism Was Roar, a jungle-themed tune about not backing down in the face of adversity. You could not turn on the radio, watch a commercial, go to a public event without hearing this song because it was absolutely everywhere. And I believe Roar still holds the YouTube record for most video views of a song from a female artist with over 4 billion views. This was a very successful era for Katie. We can't say Prism didn't do numbers because it was part of a lineup of anticipated and high-selling pop girl albums that year with the likes of Art Pop and Bangers. But in tandem with that success, culturally there was a shift happening. Around this time, conversations regarding cultural appropriation, though not brand new, had become not only more common but were being taken more seriously. This meant that art is borrowing elements from other cultures, either musically or visually, without any seeming understanding of it beyond aesthetic appreciation. While it was more acceptable in previous decades, that tide was shifting. On one hand, people were like, thank God, I've been dying for this behavior to be called out. While others were like, y'all did not do Justin, Gwen, or Christina this way, so stop it. A long, long time ago when I was really little, I got kicked out of school for having braids in my hair when I was little. So I'm gonna go back to school with braids in my hair. I think that's funny. Don't you think that's funny? I think that's funny. Though a lot of those artists' work, especially Gwen's Love Angel Music Baby, Harajuku Girl Squad, has been retroactively critiqued and is to this day on top of the contemporary criticisms that took place. Artists like Iggy Azalea and Miley Cyrus, because this was Banger's era, were heavily criticized for putting on black scents and putting out work that seemed to make caricatures of black culture, of hip hop culture, rather than showing that they were students of it. Katie got caught up in these accusations as well, with several examples of songs and videos from Prism being used. The first was the performance she gave of her song Unconditionally, Prism's second single at the AMAs in fall of 2013. Issue wasn't taken with the song, but the geisha-inspired costume and Katie donned for the performance. Headlines from days after read, Katy Perry's geisha-style performance needs to be called out, Cultural Appropriation 101 featuring geisha Katy Perry in the great wave of Asian influence, and Katy Perry's Geisha-inspired AMA's performance stirs controversy. Looking at the Katy Perry's Geisha-style performance needs to be called out article, which was published by The Atlantic, it states this instance was proof conversations around cultural appropriation were still necessary. Author Nolan Feeney wrote, Even without including any actual Asian women, Perry accomplishes something similar. She and her dancers spend much of their performance time putting their palms together and bowing, scurrying across the stage trying to be light on their feet, and hiding behind umbrellas and fans. Dainty, subservient, shy. Though there are no Japanese schoolgirls here, the imagery of the performance is hardly nuanced. Katie's stylist, Johnny Wujek, who was featured on ANTM, if you remember him, said both he and Katie loved Japan, and the dress was actually bought from a place in LA that sold kimonos, and one of the employees helped them make sure it was authentic, with the dancers wearing a more traditional version, claiming that they decided to modernize Katie's version and rework it into a gown. Prism's next single, Dark Horse, was met with similar criticism upon the release of the video. Sonically, it's been remembered as popularizing the anti-drop and popularizing that pop trap fusion that would take over pretty much the rest of the decade. The music video is inspired by ancient Egypt, but clearly a very fictionalized, costumified fantasy version. Y'all know I hate calling things cringe, but the most unserious moment to me in this video is where Katie picks up this grill and puts it in her mouth like it's some foreign treasure brought to her from some world traveling expedition which it seems like that's how it was framed within the universe of the video. And obviously it was just a gag meant to represent Katie taking on a more hip hop influence in this song. But again, Katie was accused of cultural appropriation. In an interview with Time, Matthew Cullen, the video's director, said Katie brought the concept to him after finding out there was a Memphis in ancient Egypt and Juicy J who features on the track is from Memphis, Tennessee. 
Matthew said he and Katie did do some research to make sure their depictions weren't too out of the box and that they were respectful of the symbolism. The article states, Colin says he believes that while it's dangerous to rip things directly from modern cultures without adding anything to them, ancient Egypt is part of what he calls our shared collective mythology. Lily Rothman, who wrote the Time article, contacted Egyptologists to see if there was anything accurate in the Dark Horse video, and there were a few things, like the turquoise color of Katie's makeup. The tomb paintings in the background seem accurately influenced, as well as the blend between Greek and Egyptian cultures, as Katie's look is definitely Cleopatra influenced. Aside from the Dark Horse video itself, the article pointed out a lot of people were also critical of costumes used for live performances of the song, which were also clearly meant to evoke Egypt, get your mind in that ballpark, but were very much a neon 2010s interpretation. The final nail in the prism cultural appropriation coffin, if you will, for Katie was the video for the album's final single, This Is How We Do, which was released in the summer of 2014. This picture gives me war flashbacks because it was pretty much always used in the Tumblr posts about cultural appropriation and contemporary examples of it. In response to this video and other faux pas from the era, Katie told Rolling Stone, I guess I'll just stick to baseball and hot dogs and that's it. I know that's a quote that's gonna come to f me in the ass, but can't you appreciate a culture? I guess like everybody has to stay in their lane, I don't know. In their musical retrospective of the decade, in 2019, Billboard published a series of articles deciding what the main change in music was each year. For example, they claim 2013 was the year streaming began dominating the musical landscape. 2014, they wrote, was the year that cultural appropriation dominated the pop music discussion. Speaking on the Dark Horse video, Billboard said about Katie, it was just one of the many, many controversies caused by the pop star playing fast and loose with ethnic signifiers during the Prism promo cycle, several of which were collected in an August 2014 Mike article on charitably titled, Five Reasons Katy Perry is Pop Music's Worst Appropriator. They also brought up the I'll stick to baseball and hot dogs comment that she made to Rolling Stone. Katy's next album, 2017's Witness, is the one that's probably most remembered as her flop album, especially in terms of how rampant promotions were for this new album. Katie seemed intent on creating a new image for herself, donning a blonde pixie cut, which a lot of people weren't fans of, as is often the case when women trade longer hair for something shorter. She performed the album's first single, Chain to the Rhythm, for the first time at that year's Grammys, just a couple of days after the song's release. I remember watching this live and being pretty intrigued by both the song and the concept. Chain to the Rhythm, which features Skip Marley, is a song about how we're often so lost in music, pop culture, and other frivolous things that more important issues can go over our heads. I don't think the purpose of this song was for Katie to be like, OMG, stop listening to pop music altogether because she herself is a pop star and one can be socially conscious and still like pop music. It was, however, simply a critique of hypercapitalism and how it can create this illusion of comfort with all the little frivolities it provides and how easy it is to insulate yourself from life's problems or curate a life that seems problem free even if that's not the reality. Katie sings in the refrain in one of the verses, so comfortable we're living in a bubble, so comfortable we cannot see the trouble. Aren't you lonely up there in Utopia, where nothing will ever be enough, happily numb? Though Chain to the Rhythm isn't overtly political, it's still been considered as one of Katie's most political songs, likely because of the post-election climate in which it was released, as well as its cultural critiques. The video, which was also directed by Matthew Collins, shows Katie and others in this futuristic theme park called Oblivia. Katie initially seems intrigued by Oblivia, but very quickly realizes the place is fun and entertaining, but also relies on all guests maintaining the status quo. I learned of the term bubblegum dystopia lately, and this video I think fits in well with this concept. A bubblegum dystopia is a dystopian future usually ruled by a totalitarian corporate entity. And this entity makes the world vibrant and convenient, but hollow. The citizens are reduced to consumers as their main identity. Products have often replaced art and media entirely. And in a bubblegum dystopia, all of the citizens of this world believe that they are living in the best era of humanity. The world is so beautiful and pleasing, it's hard to realize all isn't well, and these little amusements in reality are intentional distractions. I think the song and the video can work on two levels. One, saying that a lot of us are so privileged we can choose to ignore the suffering of others, lest it eventually affect us. Two, as I was saying before, it's even easy to insulate yourself from your own suffering or just reality in general by distracting yourself endlessly with a screen. The video ends with Katie being woken up from her comfy bubble by a televised message from Skip, which is also his feature in the song. However, Katie's the only one awake while everyone else is still in trance, stuck in the dance, stuck in the mold. 
Though there are definitely futuristic influences, it's also clear a lot of inspiration for the change to the rhythm video was taken from the 1950s, the era of traditional post-war Americana, this veneer of perfect American life. It was a life that was thought to be aspirational and comfortable, but it was also very much about fitting in the mold, keeping up with the Joneses. When I first heard Chain to the Rhythm, knowing it would be followed by an album, I was like, oh, what is Katie gonna get into? I wonder how the other songs will critique or at least comment on the climate we're in now. Because at this point, my thought was, as someone who's been a large part of this, made a lot of the music we might be playing inside of our comfortable bubbles, what's Katie's opinion on it after being part of this for a decade? Especially as someone who seemed to be in conflict with a lot of the cultural shifts, even pretty recently at that point. The day Change to the Rhythm came out, Katie responded to a tweet saying the entire Witness era would be purposeful pop. Also at some point during this era, she added activists to her Twitter bio. I couldn't find anywhere where Katie gave a specific concrete definition of purposeful pop, but it's pretty easy to glean that she meant pop that was more socially aware. She told the New York Times, I feel extremely liberated, liberated from the conditioning of the way I used to think, spiritually liberated, politically liberated, sexually liberated, liberated from things that don't serve me. Even with Witness, Katie went into a new direction this time, relying more on Max Martin, who executive produced the album, than Dr. Luke, who had produced the majority of her previous two albums. Seems like she never gave any direct statements about putting their working relationship on hold, but around this time, Dr. Luke was embroiled in a legal battle with Kesha over her claims of sexual assault and his claims that she and her mother were attempting to defame him. It would later come out that Katie was deposed in the summer of 2017, though Katie got dragged into the legal battle more recently and had been ongoing since 2014. So not sure if Katie and her team decided it just wasn't a good look to work with Dr. Luke at the time because his discography suggests he didn't stop producing or anything during that time. Or I guess at the very least had a bunch of songs banked up and did not stop releasing. Bon Appetit, Witness's second single, was one Katie intended to represent sexual liberation. I actually didn't know this, and while I unironically do enjoy this song, I always just thought it was a sexy, unserious bop that was just kind of disjointed and didn't necessarily belong on Witness. Throughout, Katie likens herself and sex in general to food. Clearly, Katie was going for what she was going for, and sexual liberation does fit the theme of purposeful pomp, in theory at least. But whenever I listen to Bon Appetit, I always think about how this food concept could have worked so well to critique how a lot of pop stars, especially women, are consumed like a product or a meal, and in a way are basically always laid out for consumption, be it their more private moments or things that were never intended for the public. That could even elevate lyrics like, so you want some more, while well, I'm open 24, want to keep you satisfied, customers always right. Even some shots in the music video, like the one where Katie's getting her braids chopped off, her sitting in the big pot, all of the hands on her when she's practically naked, they have more of an ominous tone to me than a sexually liberated feel, even though they're intended to like sort of play up on the comedy. The video does work to establish this new Katy Perry for the era, like we see her unveil her new haircut again towards the end when she gets served up to the Migos and the other wealthy diners, showing this is the new Katy, the real Katy. But wait, it's a trap actually. Katie is the bait and the Migos activate some statue to tie up all the diners so they can be turned into a dish also or something. And then Katie does a strip tease on the table. So I'm assuming at least visually, this is where the liberation element seems to come in, that she's freed herself. But the narrative of the video doesn't really establish what exactly Katie is freeing herself from. You could assume it's the sexualization, the expectations a lot of pop stars have put on them, but that's an assumption taken from the actual world, not anything you see represented really in the video. Apparently the concept of this video is eat the rich, which we don't necessarily really see until the end of the video, but I do guess that that means that the song and the video have slightly different themes or meanings. Witness's next single, Swish Swish, got an even more lukewarm response, mostly for its silly lyrics and even less serious video. The point of the song is to be unfazed by one's haters, not to sweat whatever they say and succeed regardless. So I actually do understand and like the unserious tone of the song, but I can see how it can come off as more of a caricature when it's put on an album branded as purposeful pop. I also somehow never really knew this song was considered to be Katie's response to Bad Blood, probably because it came out so many years after that song. It also came at a time when she was getting a lot of backlash, so I assume this was just like a hey, keep your head up because I'm keeping my head up type of song. Aside from the singles, Katie did some other entertaining yet questionable promotions for Witness. Probably the most notable is the three-day Big Brother style live stream called Katy Perry Witness Worldwide. I'm assuming this stream was done to coincide with the album's title and touch on the concept of surveillance and always feeling watched, especially as a public figure. 
The stream actually coincided with the release of Witness, and Katie stayed in the house all weekend, resting, meditating, doing yoga, and listening to her new album. Guests like Patrick Starr and James Corden showed up to visit Katie, and on the final night, she had other celebs over for a group dinner. At one point, she streamed a therapy session in which she discussed issues with her parents, struggled with substance abuse, and suicidal thoughts. Yeah, I, I uh, wrote a song about it. Okay. That's what I guess I do. That's how I process, uh, is I, I write songs. And you get rid of those feelings, those well, yeah, feelings. Some of them. Some of them don't come out okay. fully, and that's why I still, have, I still do the work. Which song was that? What lyric comes to your mind? By the Grace of God. Katie also mentioned her goal after Prism had been to be more authentic with her upcoming album, and it also cut off her hair because she didn't want to look like Katy Perry anymore. While in the house, she recorded several podcasts and interviews. One podcast was with civil rights activist DeRay McKesson, and during recording, Katie admitted regretting the green cornrows she wore in the This Is How We Do video. Even in like the This Is How We Do video about how I wore my hair and having a hard conversation with one of my empowered angels, Cleo, about what does it mean? Why, why can't I wear my hair that way? Or what is the history behind wearing the hair that way? You know, my intention to like appreciate Japanese culture, I did it wrong with a performance. And I didn't know that I did it wrong until I heard people saying I did it wrong. After this, journalist April Rain published a series of tweets saying that DeRay platforming Katie in this way felt wrong to her. And it looks like a lot of the follow-up tweets were responses to other people, but in them, April criticized Katie for allegedly going on what she called an apology tour, but not offering apologies to any black women, not consulting them or hiring them in future work. Witness did debut at number one on the Billboard 200 and actually was the biggest chart debut from a female artist since Lady Gaga's Joey in the year prior. Despite this, this was Katy's first album since her debut was Katherine Hudson, so her first as Katy Perry to not secure a number one single. Chain to the Rhythm peaked at number four, Swish Swish at number 46, and Bon Appetit at number 59. Witness also spent the least amount of time of her albums on the charts at that point, spending 21 weeks on the Billboard 200, her next lowest being one of the boys, which spent 92 weeks despite only peaking at number 9, though it was obviously sustained by a lot of hit singles. Kind of shows how much music changed in a decade too, or at least the charting dynamics. It's likely Witness spent so little time on the charts because after the singles and promo, fans either thought the album wasn't going to have the purposeful pop that was promised, or they were uninterested for other reasons. I think also a lot of people just didn't buy this era from Katie, her branding herself as being at the vanguard of politically charged pop, when she seemed adamant about avoiding political or cultural conversations for years before. In a sense, it feels like she tried to swing the pendulum too far to the other side and tell us what to think about her music and the Witness era overall, without letting the album speak for itself. And all of that's on top of her change in music and branding seemingly being a change influenced by the change in the zeitgeist, not a change Katie just made because she wanted to, especially since so much of her awakening and enlightenment was used to market the album. To me, even if I can enjoy some songs, this era comes off as please don't cancel me for good this time instead of I have plenty of observations of the climate we're in and I'm going to share them using my perspective as a pop star. Like I said, I do think Chang to the Rhythm was a good start for Witness, song, and video. I wouldn't even say it was bad to follow with Bon Appetit, just maybe what was actually being represented either lyrically or visually could have been tweaked a bit. But maybe instead of Swish Swish, I could see a different third single like the title track being good. It has a similar housey feel to Witness, but it sounds more like the Katie we know. And it's also a song that takes itself seriously enough for it to not throw people off the concept of the album entirely. Witness doesn't seem like it's overtly a cultural critique or commentary, but it still expresses feelings of loneliness, being disconnected, feeling unseen, abandoned in turbulent times. I think it would have been a good song to capture that cultural moment without being too on the nose. Because around that time, it seemed like people were becoming divided more than ever because of politics, more isolated because of things like social media, and people were realizing they might not have the level of community and connection as generations before. And then maybe something like At My Age, which is from the deluxe as a single after the album came out. That's another classic Katie Pomp song that references how adults are discouraged from having the fun they did while younger. It also kind of reads as Katie referencing the fact that she's a pop star in her early 30s, a time when most women in the genre are considered to be on their way out, even if the quality of their music isn't diminishing. On top of that, it would have been a fun song for anyone above the age of childhood to sing along with their friends and party to, kind of like a grown-up TGIF, if you will, so getting across an important message, a relatable message, but still being fun and danceable. 
Witness didn't receive great reviews, and its performance led people to believe that Katy Perry, once a pop staple, was quote unquote over. She did release a handful of singles before starting promotions for her next album, Smile. This album seemed to be marketed as more of a return to form for Katy. She grew out her hair but kept it blonde, and we got more colorful visuals, flowers, things that created that sugary sweet fantasy land a lot of people came to associate with her. This time, it seems like Katy took on a lot of inspiration from the late 60s, early 70s, and a lot of clown motifs because, of course, clowns try to get you to smile. A lot of the songs on the album were meant to express overcoming hardships in life, like broken relationships, personal turmoil, career issues. Katy actually said a lot of this album is inspired by the low that she was feeling after Witness. She led the era with Daisies, a slower electronic pop song, but another one of her classic empowerment anthems. Like Swish Swish, this is a song about not listening to people trying to drag you down, get you to change, and Katie sings that she won't change until she's covered in Daisies, aka dead. The song did actually receive positive reviews, saying that Katie was back where she was strongest, and some even likened the song to Firework. Still, Daisies only peaked at number 40 on the Hot 100. It was released in May of 2020, so it was clear a lot of the album promotions would suffer due to lockdown or just never be done. Katy was also pregnant at this time, which she had announced back in her Never Worn White video. At the time, the song, like Harley's in Hawaii and Never Really Over, they were considered stopgap singles, but later ended up making it onto the Smile track list. The title track, which came in July of 2020, is this upbeat disco song that feels like a breath of fresh air, and especially felt so at the time the song was released. The song talks about having gratitude and finally regaining one's smile, getting their pep in their scent bag after a period of adversity. Noticeably, Dr. Luke has no producing credits on this album either, with Katie working with a mix of producers including Zed, Peter Carlson, and Stargate. Most of the songs are electronic pop with hints of synth and disco, pretty perfect for the time in which the album came. Part of me wonders how differently Smile would have performed or been received had it been released right after Prism instead of Witness. Because I enjoy a lot of the songs on this album, I think they're good pop for the time and felt way more authentic for Katie than a lot of the work on Witness. But looking at the reviews, maybe I'm in the minority because the critic reviews of Smile overall are not that positive. Metacritic gave it a 58, having given Witness a 53. Enemy gave Smile 2 out of 5 stars and actually gave Witness 4 out of 5 stars. Pitchfork gave Smile a 5.7 and Witness a 4.8. Personally, I don't remember Smile being mired in any sort of controversy, really because it seems like the album was unfortunately on so few people's radars. For a couple years after the album's release, it feels like a couple of the songs would gain a little attention online here and there and people would be like, oh wow, this was actually pretty decent. And peaking at number 5, this was Katie's first album to not hit number 1 and it only spent 4 weeks on the charts. Looking at other well-performing pop albums released during lockdown, I don't know if it's fair to say that's the whole reason Smile underperformed. I'm sure part of it was so many people checking out after Witness and not really checking back in. It could have also been the case that Katie didn't promote as much, though options were obviously limited, because she was either heavily pregnant or caring for a newborn leading up to the album's release and for months after. So yeah, I think Smile's worst offense was maybe that people didn't really enjoy it or know much about it. At this point, I was like, damn, this is probably Katie's last album, but hey, at least I enjoy it. She started her residency at the end of 2021, making it even clear that she probably wouldn't release again for a while, if ever. But at one of her shows, she did say, if you couldn't love me in my Witness and Smile eras, then you can't love me in my KP6 era. And now I've seen some people say, yeah, girl, you were right. Because before it was even confirmed that Katie was coming back, there were blind items and murmurs that Katie was intending to work with Dr. Luke again, despite the allegations and accusations. Surely her motivation was to recapture the success of her earlier albums, which she may have associated with the work that Dr. Luke did. That blind item, if it was about Katie, turned out to be true, as it was confirmed in June of this year that Katie would be working with him on an upcoming single, and the album too, which we now know. People obviously expressed their disappointment, suggested that Katie was desperate, or said this news nixed any excitement they initially had over a new Katie album. A source from her label said about this, Katie knew exactly the album she wanted to make and put together the team to make it happen. And that includes previous collaborators, including Luke, Stargate, Max Martin, and Sarah Hudson. There is speculation going around that Katie's contractually obligated to work with Dr. Luke and still owes him three more albums, and was just given a break during his lawsuit, therefore really has no choice. Back in 2017, in her deposition during Kesha and Dr. Luke's legal battle, Katie actually said she'd never been signed to Dr. Luke's Kimosabi Records or any of his imprints or even RCA, and only had a three-album publishing deal with him, which would have been fulfilled with Prism. 
She also said she chose not to work with him on witness due to potential backlash claiming, just that I would be attacked, I would be the one woman that is against women and I'm not against women, but I believe in innocent until proven guilty and I believe in justice. And this quote was in response to being asked in that deposition why she didn't work with him on her most recent album. If they could, things got even worse when people realized the song, which is called Woman's World, was obviously meant to be an empowerment song. In my opinion, working with Dr. Luke basically sealed the fate on this song, but even without his involvement, I don't think it would have made much noise or been so groundbreaking. Like I've said before, I feel like a lot of the lyrics are kind of subpar compared to Katie's past empowerment anthems like Roar or Daisies or Firework. Fire in her eyes, and this one just sounds like it was written to check boxes and force people to enjoy it rather than writing a good song and people enjoying it as a result. Similar to Witness, it feels like another example of Katie telling us how to feel about her music and how to think about her in terms of the marketing, which speaks for the song rather than supports or reinforces it, and the final product is more hollow than the cult attempted to be built around it. Aside from people being underwhelmed by the song, confusion was also expressed over the narrative of the video and what it was attempting to communicate. I think what's going on here is that Katie and the other women and the gays are just trying to make it in the world and have to trudge on. But it seems like this world, if it's run by women, sucks and it's full of discord. I think the intention was that we're supposed to be seeing the real world being rescued by women, but we don't see any representations of that other than a uterus dangling from a monster truck and a ring light shaped like the female symbol. We don't see women making the world better or women living in a utopia that is so idyllic because it's run by women. Maybe we see the construction workers building a better world in the beginning, but we also don't see the results of that world being built. Going through the comments, a lot of people didn't seem to be impressed with the song or the video, with someone even suggesting I Kissed a Girl did more for woman empowerment than woman's world. In response, Katie released a video calling the woman's world video satire. And while Katie explained more of her thought process behind the video's concept, she doesn't really explain what she's satirizing. Um, and very on the nose. And with this set, um, it's like, oh, uh, we're like, we're not about the male gaze, but we really are about the male gaze. And we're really overplaying it and on the nose because I'm about to get smashed, which is like a reset, a reset for me and a reset for my idea of feminine divine. Maybe that can make sense, but that's also not really what we're shown based on the very pointed changing of the construction sign or women circling around with vibrators or using the urinals as if they're men. All of that seems meant to even frame that portion of the video as feminist or showing empowered women, women who are liberated and not catering to the male gaze or male desires, topped off by Katie's Rosie the Riveter inspired look. Even if the beginning of the video is truly showing Katie's flawed feminism as she's kind of putting it before this so-called reset, Again, I'm struggling to understand how the world that she falls into after this reset is much different. People's interest with the Woman's World video and song definitely reflected on the charts where it debuted at number 63. The song's only been on the charts for a week at this point, but I think it's unlikely it will rise any higher based on the initial reception. Looking back at these 15 years of Katie's career or so, despite the meteoric highs, the smash hits, the records, it's clear at points there was conflict with her image or perception. First, blatantly not heeding a lot of criticisms about her lyricism, a lot of her stage costumes, maybe out of genuine ignorance, maybe out of willful ignorance or not caring, and potentially not necessarily having to care because it just seemed like there was a loud minority who took issue. Yet when the tide shifted and Katie became a sort of representative of some aspects of cultural appropriation or problematic pop, she attempted to overcorrect her image with that purposeful pomp, which seemed ill-defined and like a knee-jerk response to the criticism she received. The concept was also dropped pretty quickly after the album underperformed. And now I'm not sure if it was or wasn't Katie's intention, but it does seem like a logical consequence of this. Releasing Woman's World and collaborating with Dr. Luke to do the song makes the Witness era look even less authentic than a lot of people thought it was even back in 2017, as her choice can easily come off as she was never invested in liberation, be it spiritual, sexual, or political, as we were meant to believe that she had become. 
As always, be sure to let me know your thoughts and opinions down below in the comments. Like I said, these were mostly my observations, my perspective of Katie's career. And it's like, while we can concretely point to these things having happened, my analysis is just my analysis. It is subjective. So I would be eager to hear your thoughts. Do you think these culture shifts and Katy Perry seeming attempts to get ahead of the narrative, if you will, negatively impacted her career? Do you think it was a case of Prism and Teenage Dream, especially just being so big, just everywhere, breaking records, that there was no way that Katie or any other artist could have replicated that? success so maybe even if we didn't get witness we would have never got an album that was going to meet prism or even surpass it so lots to think about lots to talk about like i said thoughts could be all over the place but i'm eager to hear them all down below as always thank you so much for watching be sure to like comment and subscribe so that you can stick around for more and if you'd like to become a channel member and get early access to videos the link is in the description again thank you so much for watching i love you all so very much and we'll see you so very soon Bye bye